I want to welcome folks back to our fifth interview that we're doing um, as a series of talking with staff members at the Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center in preparation for our main town meeting on June 1st, where the director of the Policy Center, uh, Jonathan Rubin, will be our guest talking about the work that the Policy Center does. And to provide more depth, we wanted to talk with different staff members and hear about the projects they're working with. And so our Fifth interview will be with Peggy McKee, uh, who is a research associate at the Policy Center. Good afternoon, Peggy. How are you? Ah, fine, Hi. thank you. Good afternoon. Well, Happy thank you. Here. Thank you for taking the time. How long have you been with the Policy Center? Um, I have been working here uh, a little more than ten years. Wow. So um, one of the striking things has been uh, how young many of the staff members are and how recently they've come to work at this policy center. So you're one of the people who has more of a long-term perspective at the policy center. I, yeah, I suppose that's true. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what, are, what is your current portfolio of, of projects that you work on? Well, I, um, I work largely on student programs. Um, oh. So I manage a number of the student programs here. Um, and I also do a bit of work on research projects that come up that um, are appropriate to some of my background skills. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And has your position evolved in the 10 years that you've been with the Policy Center? Um, it has. I started out um, also working on some student programs, but as mm -hmm. a sort of an assistant. Um, and I was uh, very much part time, and I've sort of fluctuated part time to full time over those um, over those years. Mm -hmm. um, and what are some of the student projects that you oversee? Um, the there are three primary student programs that I work with. Um, one is the Margaret Chase Smith Public Affairs Scholarship, which the center administers here. Mm -hmm. um, and also you, you participate in, uh, in some of that program mm -hmm. you know, with from the library's uh, side. And um, so that's a single student, sometimes two, but usually a single student scholarship uh, for a school year. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, another program that we run here is called the Maine Policy Scholars Program. And that is a program that is funded by the uh, Maine Community Foundation, and we we help to administer it and to run the program, and that involves one student from each of the seven Humane System campuses, mm -hmm. um, and they work together on individual individually uh, chosen programs throughout the the school year. Mm -hmm. And then the other program that I work with is the Maine Government Summer Internship Program. Okay, well, we'll start with the public affairs uh, scholarship since um, I do have some familiarity with that. And we've recently gone through the selection process. Um, and this gives students a chance to pick their own uh, project to consider the public policy elements of it. And, uh, and are there any over the years that you've done it? Uh, what are the projects that stand out to you? Um, they, there's a real variety of uh, projects that students have done. Um, part of the requirement is that they be relevant to Maine. Mm -hmm. um, so there is, there's also some, um, perhaps repetition of, of or, or uh, um, similarity among some of the projects when you look back over time. Um, but uh, there was one project early on um, when I started here mm -hmm. that where a student was using, he was a, a music student and he was using um, music to, do you recall that one? I do. I was trying to remember his name because one of the, uh, another feature of this program is that once they're selected, um, they're expected to come to the Margaret Chase Smith Library. So over the years, we, we, weren't, we weren't always involved in the selection process, but we've always been involved in actually meeting the students. And I do remember him 
again, I'm still trying to fish in my mind for his, his, uh, um, his name. And so what was the nature of his project? Well, you know, I honestly can't, I, I mention him because I recall him, but I can't, I don't know the exact topic of his project, but what stood out to me was that um, his focus was music, yet mm -hmm. he was applying that skill to policy yep. in a way that was very creative. I mean, typically we get uh, public, uh, sorry, political science students are, are pretty common, mm -hmm. um, but, but really the scholarship and the, the concept are applicable to students in any field because anybody can identify a, a public policy mm -hmm. issue Mm -hmm. and and address it from a you know any number of angles um one one recent one that really stood out to me was the math student we had i think i think it was maybe two years ago who was looking at a way to model um the oh, opioid yeah. epidemic uh in the state mm -hmm. and and using mathematics as a way to um do research to inform policy on how to address that that problem. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's the perfect opportunity to highlight that what we've been doing these interviews since the pandemic started. And you're actually, I think, the 61st interview that we've done. And along the way, we've done some public affairs scholars. And the person you're referring to, his name is Cole Butler. That's right. And if people want to hear more about his project, they can go to our YouTube channel, The MCS Library, and find his interview, Cole Butler. And actually, when I was interviewing, he's gone on to graduate school, I believe, at North Carolina State, uh, where I think he's going to be working on his PhD, where he's continuing to pursue his interest in particular in epidemiology. Um, and uh, some other uh, public affairs scholars who are, I have interviewed and you'd find on this YouTube channel, um, Abby Dupre, who did a project on student voting. And then uh, some more recent ones, Thomas Adams, who um, was, I think, in teacher training and his interest was civics, how um, civics can be become more of the curriculum and we can do a, a better job of te teaching civics in schools. And he was very committed to that. And then um, more recently, uh, Ellie Pelletier, whose project is about, she wants to be a veterinarian. And so she was interested in addressing the shortage of veterinarians in the state of Maine, in particular in rural areas. Uh, so, uh, have, are the decisions official for this year? Uh, yes, we, we uh, have made a decision for this year. We are funding, um, we are awarding two scholarships, one to, again, Ellie Pelletier to continue to expand um, the work that she has started on um, the shortage of uh, veterinarians in the state and how to address that problem. Mm -hmm. um, and the other student, Michael, Michael Delorge. Yes. Uh, his project, um, you probably recall well, that. I do, well, sorry. one aspect of it is uh, drug courts. He's um, interested in seeing if uh, instituting drug courts would be a better way of trying to address the drug issues in the state of Maine. Right. Uh, so this is a doer project. So it, it, it's, it's somewhat still in conception in terms of what we saw, whereas Ellie is a year into it. So she was able to, to push it a little further in terms of actually getting to that policy stage. Right. And it's also meant to be a learning process. So students do come into the scholarship program at different stages. You know, some have done background work on their topic that they've chosen, and they they really are ready to to charge in and and mm -hmm. come up with a solution. And and mm -hmm. others just have identified something that they consider a problem mm -hmm. or a, a an obstacle or or something. Um, for example, there was a student further back a few years ago who um, was looking at solid waste. Um, I was remembering that. 
yeah. on campus. So very localized, yeah. um, but yet still a, a policy issue. Um, mm-hmm. And and uh, so so some start, you know, some start further into their topic than others, and and they all progress towards um, identifying, you know, understanding the process of how do you address an issue and how do you research an issue and then uh, coming up with a solution. Uh, They all are usually pretty committed to the project they have in mind. And then sort of your role is to push them into that idea of how you turn that idea and that passion into policy. That's right. That's right. They are all, um, you know, they have their own background stories about why they are passionate about the topic that they've chosen. Um, and they all work with their own uh, academic advisor mm-hmm. um, who, who provides the structure in the background to, to get them to the, to the end result. And so there are some stages along the way. They're expected to come to the Margaret Chase Smith Library. And I think they're uh, do a report like halfway through the year. And then uh, towards the end of the year, they're expected to do a presentation or a poster about their project. Um, and, and oftentimes, as you mentioned, it, it may be part of a larger project they're working on, like an honors thesis. Mm-hmm. Sure. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, so that's the public affairs scholarship. And that from, from the student standpoint, there is um, scholarship money that assists with their tuition. And so in case there's anyone out there listening and and interested in applying or telling students who might be eligible, what are the eligibility requirements and when are the deadlines? Uh, Yeah, that's uh, the dead. The applications are taken uh, every year in the spring. Um, The application this year was mid April. Um, I think it might shift a little for next year, maybe a little bit earlier, but it is usually the March, April timeframe. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, the scholarship is a $3,500 uh, award to the, mm-hmm. to the student who, they, um, for their work. And um, yeah, it, the, the process has changed a little bit for, so for any student, um, at UMaine, uh, the the award comes to their attention through an online um, program called Scholarship Universe, which is the way the university has changed their um, notices about scholarships. So it should um, it should in the future be um, made available the information made available to a much wider audience. Mm-hmm. Is any year eligible? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, any year? No, they must have completed two years of college. Very good. And then you talked about the Maine Policy Scholars Program. How does that differ from the Public Affairs Scholarship? Um, well, the Maine Policy Scholars Program, it, in in um, in its sense, it is actually very similar in its mm-hmm. goals. Um, it's, it's a program that was established um, by the late Peter Cox, who was uh, the editor of the Maine Times newspaper. Um, and he, he, it, it started just with a small group of students and it has since um, expanded to include each of the seven campuses, which chooses, each campus chooses one student and one faculty member who work together throughout the year. Um, and it has very similar goals to the public affairs scholarship in that the student comes into the program with an idea of a, a problem that they've mm-hmm. identified um, in the state and they want to find a solution to it. And so it, in, the pro, in the course of the year, they learn about how to, act, how to accomplish research, how to do research, how to interview people. Um, and they t- then how to look at solutions. And so the, the goal of the program is to teach students that um, good policy solutions require research, um, mm-hmm. should be informed by research. And um, then by the end of the year, they do a similar um, presentation to 
uh, a panel a, a panel of um, policy practitioners and to their peer group mm -hmm. um, and they present a they present their solution in the form of a memo to the governor okay. so it's really meant to be uh, sort of emulating the the legislative process mm -hmm. um, and that the it's you know they're not writing a 10 page paper and they're not doing an academic paper um, they're really proposing a, a, a policy change. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that, oh, sorry, the other thing that's unique about um, this uh, policy scholars program is there's a focus on not only working with an academic advisor, but also identifying what we call a community mentor, okay. uh, which is somebody who is a practitioner in whatever field the students pro project is 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 in um or is is applicable to who can provide some sort of like a real world perspective on what the student is um proposing mm -hmm. do these seven students do they work independently on their campuses um apart from it sounds like at the end they do come together to share their work but are there, are there other opportunities for the seven plus their mentors and the community mentor to interact prior to that final session? Yeah, um, and that's that's a piece of the program that makes it a little bit uh, special. We have, there are four uh, established um, events or group meetings that they have throughout the year. So they, they start off the program with a, a weekend retreat oh. of a deep dive into their project and mm -hmm. the, their peers and the, you know, the, the whole process. Mm -hmm. um, and then that is meant to sort of create, um, create some relationships where they can keep help each other, you know, support each other in their mm -hmm. process throughout the year and learn from each other. And the faculty involved have uh, different disciplines. And so they are often able to provide useful um, input and, and advice to other students who are not necessarily their own student. Um, so it really does work as a, as a group. Yeah. Um, that's the goal. So it sounds like there's a bit more structure to this program than the Public Affairs Scholarship where it's more independent. Yeah, I, I would say that's accurate, yep. Uh, and are there any memorable projects that you can think of from the Policy Scholars Program? Oh, gosh. Any um, interesting memos to governors? <laughs> well, the one of the recent ones was a, uh, a young woman from Farmington who was looking at the, the um, issue of invasive green crabs. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Well, you know, I, I know very little about this program, but like the one project I know about is the green crab program. <laughs> She actually got some pretty good publicity um, okay. on her on her project, mm -hmm. um, but she was proposing ways to uh, control the the population of green crabs by um, creating a market for them, um, mm -hmm. either a food a food market, culinary market, or some other incentive for people to harvest the green crabs and uh, mm -hmm. get mm -hmm. get the population down. Um, there are some other ones, uh, in the past, often some of the students at Fort Kent have been forestry students. And so mm -hmm. they're looking at particular, uh, issues within forest management. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a memorable student a couple of years ago who was looking at the topic of, um, uh, limitations of housing for seniors in the state. And, uh, she, she took her um, project and her proposal to the legislature, mm -hmm. um, was learned a lot in the process, um, testified before a committee, or testified, presented before mm -hmm. a committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Have you had your culminating event this year? No, we're actually just starting out. Um, so we, the time frame of that program has changed. It's, mm -hmm. We're now back on sort of an academic year schedule. So the, the students have just been chosen on each okay. campus and they're just starting to do some of their background work over the summer and they will finish in the spring next year in okay. late April. When will the retreat be? 
uh, that is uh, right after the semester starts, so early September. Okay, and does it rotate around where it, that occurs? Yeah, no, it, we try to choose the most central place because everybody's got to travel. Um, and so for some of the campuses, that, that's a, a big travel. <laughs> so it, we tend to hold it in the Bangor Orno area because that's pretty much central. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And your third program, uh, the Maine State Government Internships. So tell us more about that, what the, some of the internships are and how many students you support through it. Um, yeah, the Maine Government Summer Internship Program um, was actually started back in the 1960s oh, wow. uh, by some legislation that um, was meant to establish a sort of a, I guess you call it a pipeline of okay. you know, students who would be interested in working in state government. And at that mm -hmm. time it was just state government. Um, and I believe the um, Margaret Chase Smith Policy Center started their role in administering the program more recently um, in the maybe 1980s or 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, now it includes municipal government. So we have, um, this year, for example, we have 52 internships mm -hmm. um, for which we select students, um, <clears throat> excuse me, place them in, in the summer internships, um, which are 12 week full time paid internships. Um, and most of them are in the Augusta area because the majority still are um, in state agencies. Yeah. But uh, we also have municipal internships, and those can be, um, you know, dispersed around the state. Mm -hmm. Were you able to fill all 52 intern internships this year? We actually, we 52 are the ones we filled. We started out with a few more okay. that we were unable to fill. Okay. Yeah. Is that a typical number? Oh. It's, sort of, it's on the high side, actually. Um, I think our our largest number of internships was 60. And that was a few years ago. It does tend to go up and down um, each year. What are the eligibility requirements for students? Those students need to have completed their first year of college. So entering entering their second year and they can be undergraduates or graduating mm -hmm. or even uh, graduate students. We do place a number of grad students, uh, usually law students um, as well. Do they have to be going to a main school or, can, or is it, do they just have to be a main resident? Yeah. Or, or, um, one, or one or the other? It, it's one or the other. Okay. They, they either are main residents, either going to school in state or out of state, mm -hmm. or they can be out of state students going to school in Maine. Okay. Um, so it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty broad. Mm -hmm. And what are the timelines for any students who might be interested for next year? Uh, the internship program takes applications starting in the beginning of February, and the deadline is usually March 1st. Okay. Um, and so one of the interesting things about the way we do this program is that we take requests from supervisors mm -hmm. for an intern mm -hmm. at the same time as we take applications from students. And then we have um, a, several committees who do a, a matching process to select uh, the student the, the student that uh, fits the job best. Um, so are, are you saying that the students going into it don't necessarily know what the jobs are going to be? Yes, that's exactly right. And that that's a little twist to the program. Um, so they're and, not applying for a specific job. They're just want, they're applying for the internship. That's right. They're applying to the program um, and they can look, we encourage them to look at what some of the jobs have been in past years to get an idea of what they might be. Mm -hmm. But we can't really say exactly what jobs we have. Yeah. And so that, that works two ways. It, it, um, for some students, it, you know, they, they want to know exactly what they're applying for because they're very focused. Mm -hmm. um, but the benefit of doing it that way is that many students don't know that much about what state agencies actually do. And so they, if they were say a 
communication student or a um, you know a computing student, they might not apply to a job in the Department of Labor, mm -hmm. but the job description might actually fit their skills, and it opens up a whole world of learning um, about what government does um, that goes beyond the job description. Mm -hmm. So that that's the benefit of doing it that way. It gets a little complicated sometimes. Mm -hmm. And once this gets going in the summer, uh, do you have supervisory responsibilities for it? Or at that point, is it just between the agency and the student? Um, we have a few responsibilities because one of the goals of the program is to also provide um, some educational, uh, an educational component. Um, and, and what does that I, consist of? That involves... Um, to, historically, that has involved um, spending a whole, taking one day out of the summer and spending the whole day um, at the state house, learning about different roles and offices and um, how state government functions. And um, this year, and we are splitting that between the state house and um, learning about municipal government. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of trying to encompass the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the other thing that we try to do with students is to encourage connections um, among the intern groups so they learn from each other. So we have a couple of social events. We have a picnic. Um, we, we try to um, provide opportunities for them to, to meet each other mm -hmm. and, and learn from each other. So we started doing these interviews during the course of the pandemic and invariably the discussion would turn to how the pandemic was affecting our work. How has the pandemic affected these programs either for the better or for the worse? Um, well, it has definitely made it difficult to provide some of what we just talked about with, which mm -hmm. is those connections. You probably didn't have too many picnic in 2020. <laughs> no, and in fact, all our programming was was on Zoom, but it actually allowed us to do something um, a little bit different, which was find people uh, across the state who would speak to groups of interns on Zoom about their particular branch of, uh, of government, whether it was a uh, a municipality or a community organization or a county or, or state agency. Um, so it allowed us to give a little bit more um, variety uh, of programming to the students, even though it was remote. Mm -hmm. Well, I wanna thank you for sharing these different student projects that you're working on. And you talked about one, one point how the state had created the the government internships, this idea of creating a pipeline of people who will become interested in public policy. And it's sort of trite to say, but obviously these young people are will be our future policymakers. So thank you for the work you do, teaching them and, and introducing them in many ways to what public policy is. Um, and, and you you mentioned that you also work on public policy projects yourself. Are there any that you want to mention or highlight before we move on and wrap up oh a couple of, oh, sorry that was an echo um the uh a couple of projects that i have worked on that i've truly enjoyed were some of the um, reports that the policy center uh, has put out over the past years um a number of years ago we we um put out a um uh, report called po Poverty in Maine, which was a, a broad survey of many different measurements of the, the state. Um, and I, I helped with that um, report. Now, would that have been like very early on in your career? Because I think I do remember that. And it, it seems like it was like, like maybe about 10 years ago. Or... Uh, yeah, there was, um, I want to say 2015 may have been the last time I was involved in that. Uh, that was when Ann Atchison with, was yeah. with the Policy Center yeah. for a long time. Um, and most recently, I've, I was um, participating in a report we just put out on road salt mm -hmm. uh, in Maine. And uh, that, was, that was especially fun to work on. 
And that's got some attention in the news. I've seen at least two television news reports about it and other coverage in newspapers as well. Well, it's it's uh, pretty relevant because mm -hmm. we all use road salt and it affects us all. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's a topic everybody can identify with. I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, very good. Well, thank you very much for sharing uh, about the work that you do at the Policy Center. And again, just to remind people that we're doing these interviews as a lead up uh, to our main town meeting on June 1st, where the speaker will be the director of the Policy Center, Jonathan Rubin. And we hope people will um, be able to join us for that either in person or via Zoom. I will put the link to the registration uh, as part of this post on Facebook, and it'll also be on our YouTube channel, the MCS Library. And uh, our Facebook is just the Margaret Chase Smith Library. So thank you very much, Peggy. My pleasure. Thank you. Nice to talk with you. Thanks. Bye-bye.